Hello, and a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, welcome to the CYF Children, Young People and Families Roundtable Seminar, Building Back Better. We'll be exploring this subject over the next hour. Um, and please, at any time you want to ask any questions, just put it in the chat and we will have opportunities to answer questions. But first of all, I would love to introduce you to everybody here in the room who will be speaking uh, on the matter. So first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ami Bahari. I am CEO and founder of the Hebe Foundation, a Christian youth organization working um, with uh, every all young people and especially with churches, Baptist churches uh, across London and beyond uh, to help further our ministries and our outreach. Um, I'm also on the board of directors at London Baptists and part of the CYF Roundtable. And let me introduce you to everybody else. Firstly, let me introduce you to Dan Holland. He is the youth and community worker at Port Track Baptist Church, which is part of the North Western Baptist Association. Also here is Savannah Cook. She is pioneer minister in training at Wokenham Baptist Church which is part of Southern Counties Baptist Association. We've also got Karis Lambert. She is the families and children's worker at Worcester Park, London, Worcester Park Baptist Church, which is uh, part of London Baptists. <laughs> and we've got Josiah Barron. And Josiah is a student currently in year 12, and he's kind of in different places, but he's in London, and is it down in Devon, Cornwall? Just right? Yep, lovely. Cool. Okay, excellent. So we've got a lovely um, group um, of panellists here who are going to be speaking and sharing their wisdom on this topic. So we are really excited um, to be here with you and hope that you're really going to get something out of this seminar and have a bit more of a clear and greater understanding of the mission that lies ahead for us. And this year has not been easy. This year and the previous year has taken its toll on everybody, especially uh, one of the groups that have been stretched beyond their young understanding are children and young people. Um, within my ministry, my organisation, we help a lot of Baptist churches develop their CYF ministries, like I said, and the call for support to help get back on track has been very loud. Um, 2020 through to now has seen some churches adapt and stay connected, whilst others have struggled to engage with their children, youth and families. And we are now at the point of a potential, potential crisis of losing some generations if we don't rebuild. Either way, we've entered into a new season as a society, as the body of Christ and as the local church. So what does rebuilding this vital ministry look like in a post lockdown world? How can we make sure that all that was good about focusing on the family throughout this time doesn't get lost and that we keep God at the center of our navigation. So some interesting conversations to have, I'm sure. But first of all, we're going to show you a quick video and we're going to hear from the voices of some young people across the associations um, responding to the question, how have you encountered God this past year? encountered God when I was on my bed reading some of my Bible and he cleared my head of all the worries so that I could understand it more and I've encountered God in school because we had to do this maths quiz and he helped me get through that and it's been really hard because I haven't seen my baby cousin a lot. Well sometimes I listen to my God music Sometimes I imagine a whiteboard in my head and God draws me pictures and sometimes I think about the Holy Spirit being my right hand man. Another time that I feel like I've encountered God this year was when I was talking to a friend and she was trying to find herself and she was really struggling and I remember talking to her and saying some really words that really helped her and benefited her 
I, I can't remember the exact words I said, but um, I felt like they came from God and really from his heart and just using me as his disciple to speak those to my friends. Yesterday when I was writing about the Trinity, I felt God was with me and giving me the knowledge to understand it. I have probably encountered God um, on online church and also I think I've encountered him a lot when we're singing and we're looking at the lyrics. It just, they spoke out to me more because there's less of us so I can hear them more clearly and I guess it's kind of like you suddenly see the meaning of them and how important and incredible they are. With my family I collected some leaves, sticks, seeds and made the picture. God showed me that his world is amazing and I am too. I was told to pray consistently for a year um, over something that you would quite like to happen. So this one thing that I chose to pray for, I kept feeling like it wasn't happening and it made me really sad. Um, but I went to a youth alpha at my youth and we were watching a video and there were two men and they were talking about how you might find that God has answered your prayers, just not in a way that you saw before. And I, I went back from that and I tried to focus and see if my prayers had been answered and they were and I just hadn't seen it before. Um, so I think that's the way that I've encountered God this year. <laughs> Really, it's so good to hear um, the different voices and, and how everyone has um, interacted with God. And, and it's it's brilliant to see what God is doing, um, you know, even if we're not quite too sure how he's doing it or when he's doing it. it he We know he is working um, in and behind the scenes and it's wonderful to hear such a thing. Um, it's not been brilliant for everybody. And there are some, uh, it's been hard. There's a few negative statistics that have impacted us and children and families. Um, I hear so many stories, uh, so many people, so many parents come up to me and said, we're struggling. We're really struggling in our homes, you know, um, people in two beds, one beds, families continuously 24 hours it's it's not easy and all sorts of um issues and, and and things have come up around that but we have to look at some of the good as well and see what we can learn from that so i'm gonna pass on to caris and she's going to explore family ministry and see how we what we can do to rebuild family and ministry caris So the last 14 months of the pandemic and the three lockdowns have had a huge effect on our ministry to families. We've not been able to meet our families, visit them or talk to them face to face. We've watched them from afar as they've coped with homeschooling, with working from home, with navigating church as families. 
dealing with the educational, physical, emotional and spiritual needs of their children, all within the four walls of their home. But we have been unable to venture into that space with them physically. And many of us have had to deal with all these things too, with the losses, the illnesses, the pain, the financial hardships, the furloughing and the whole new world of technology. Yes, we thank God for Zoom, but while it has been a blessing for many families and children, it has been a curse for others who have struggled with limited resources, special educational needs, overwhelming screen fatigue and basic boredom. Family workers have been amazingly creative and innovative. Some have become mini movie makers, designers of beautiful activity sheets and creators of the best online games, otherwise known as, yes, we're going on yet another scavenger hunt. To be honest, others of us have really struggled to maintain a presence in our families' lives. At best, we have offered some options, not the normal we're used to, but the closest that we can create in the circumstances. At worst, we have just overwhelmed families with emails, videos, Zoom links, desperately trying to justify our roles and keep our ministries going. But there have been some good points in this gloom and frustration. We have seen families taking responsibility for the spiritual nurturing of their children in their home. And we have met some new families through the initiatives that we have been able to do. For me, creating Messy Church in a bag was one blessing that I was able to share. And it helped me to meet people where they were just for a few minutes to pass on some love, hope and encouragement. We have been able to include more families in our online services. They've been praying on the Zoom calls or preparing videos for our YouTube services. And we have heard fantastic stories of how children are engaging in these services, often in ways that we didn't expect them to. One boy in my church who is on the autistic spectrum has fetched his Bible every week to read along with us as we followed the Bible Society Bible series. Another has shouted his prayers at the screen and been a little frustrated that no one can hear him. There have been so many other examples going on in all our churches. So as we come out of this latest lockdown and as we look to the future of meeting face to face in a building and maybe one day not having to scour the fantastic coronavirus advice documents on the Baptist Together website, what do we take with us from this time? And how do we rebuild family ministry? What on earth will it look like? I have very little time to say so much, but I think that what we have to do is start and finish with our families and where they are. We need to listen to them and hear what they need to be able to continue this amazing role of spiritually parenting their children. We need to resource them and pray for them. We need to encourage them and bless them when it's hard and share the celebration with them when it all seems to be having an effect. We need to disciple them alongside their children so that as families, they are walking their spiritual journey together. And all of this is explained and expounded through Rachel Turner's fantastic book, It Takes a Church to Raise a Parent. What I feel we don't need is to take their children away from them and do it all for them. Now we are back to normal. We also need to encourage the whole church to be a family. So many of our services online have been more intergenerational in nature, maybe out of necessity, but not without benefits for everyone. Now we need to encourage every opportunity for the whole church family to be together 
when we return face to face. We need to learn to be together as church family and to see what everyone can bring. We need to provide other Christian role models for the young people and families to see and learn from at different stages of their life and the parenting journey. And we need to bless the older generations who have missed the love and life and laughter of the younger members of our church family. We need to eat together and pray together and work together. And please see Martin Kane's amazing book, Messy Togetherness, which outlines so many amazing benefits of intergenerational church. What I feel we don't need is to recreate all our strictly segregated age groups that never meet with each other and never share life and faith together. We also need to work in partnership with our families to really benefit their children. Dr. Sarah Holmes from the Nurturing Young Faith Project at Liverpool Hope University has done some recent research which shows that the biggest increase in a child's individual faith comes when they have significant involvement with family faith, church discipleship and faith role models. This is the orange principle, the red, the love and family and the yellow, the light of Christ through the church come together to impact the faith and life of a young person. So we need to be alongside our families, sharing life with them, supporting them in their amazing role and resourcing them from our experiences and training so that we can bless their families. What we don't want to do is just to go back to how it used to be. So let's ask questions. Let's seek God's spirit for this time and move forwards into a new normal. Let's be prepared to be flexible to fail often, to succeed more, and be willing to admit when it all hasn't worked as we hoped. And let's re-envisage our roles so that we become facilitators for the families, not spiritual nannies taking the responsibility away from them. Let's become inspirers to encourage the whole church to be a family together. And let's love and listen to and learn from our families and their children so that we can build a whole new way of being church together. Thanks. Thank you, Karis. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, there's, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, just thank you so much. We're, we're going to go into that, um, but I just want to give people opportunity to please do post your questions in the chat so we can um, answer them. You're, some of you are getting there, you're getting there, but we'd love to hear what you have to say in response to what Karis has spoken about the families, how important that is right now. Um, Karis, I've got a question for you. Mm. Like I said, working with lots of different churches, they're all telling me that um, it's hard to get the families back because families have got comfortable being at home especially on a Sunday um you know parents don't have to and guardians don't have to get the children ready and, and rush to get to church so how do we bring them back into the church because there's so much richness there when we gather together the bible says we should gather together the brethren should and you know we know the benefits of um, children being with other children. So how do we get the families back to get come out of that, what feels comfortable mm. situation in their home, but back into mm. church? Mm. That's an interesting one, I mean, I think we need to really just show them how much we, we want them to be there, how much we need them, um, get them involved as much as possible by, you know, bringing things to the service, being part of the service. Um, I know a lot of churches are going to continue a hybrid model and we need to make sure that the families are included in one way or another. So if they choose to stay at home, they're still fully part of what's going on and we can still, you know, incorporate them, involve them and benefit from them. Um, I think it's just telling them how much we've missed them, how much we love them 
we want them back with us, that the whole church wants them, you know. I think it's important for all ages that, that we meet again together and the, the older folk have really missed seeing children, seeing families and, and learning and, and being with them. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. We have a very specific question, okay. Um, is it possible to access or for you to signpost some age-specific online resources for grandparents to use with grandchildren abroad that they haven't seen in person for like 18 months? So, I mean, that's really specific, but any, any resources, um, online resources for grandparents um, to use with their grandchildren, especially those who have been separated? Mm. Wow, that's, that's a great question. Um, Something that I've been following a lot online is, is called Together at Home and there's some fantastic resources that have been produced all through lockdown and are still being produced and they're on a website called Together at Home but also you can access them via Facebook um, and weekly there's activity sheets which have all kinds of, of things to do um, with adults and children together, there's, there's prayer activities, there's creative things to do um, it's actually based on the, the Church of England lectionary, so it moves through different passages of the Bible week by week. Um, but there's also great sessions that link up with, with Easter, Christmas, Pentecost, things like that. Um, so I, I think I'd recommend looking at Together at Home and seeing what's, what's available there. Thank you. That's great. Together at Home. Okay, and then there's another question. Um, or statement from Tony um, for many of our smaller churches it's not a question of getting the families back it's a question of reaching families for the first time how might we go about that personally I would I would signpost there to Messy Church and look at, um, at what Messy Church can offer in that way um, Messy Church is an intergenerational missional way of being church and it really is a uh, is aimed at reaching those who don't already come to church. So if you haven't looked into Messy Church already, there's a great website, there's lots of books and resources. Um, and all through the lockdown as well, it's proved a great way for people to keep in touch. Um, lots of people have, have produced Messy Church resources and sent them home to, for families to use at home and then linked up with them through all kinds of, of, of technological ways and, and, and so on to, to bring all that back together. So. My recommendation would be look at Messy Church first. Um, but yeah, reaching into our communities is so important. I think some of our other speakers later are going to talk about some different ways for that as well. Brilliant, thank you. And then um, finally, just a lot of people are asking, can you just say the book titles again that you mentioned? Sure, sure. So, so the one recommendation I'd really make is a book by Rachel Turner called It Takes a Church to Raise a Parent. And that is all about how we can minister to parents and help them to be the, the main spiritual nurturers of, of their children's faith. Um, but it's really aimed for those within the church reaching out to parents. It's a great, great resource book. Rachel is um, the head of Parenting for Faith. And again, there's a, a brilliant website you can look at, Parenting for Faith, that has masses of resources to use for supporting parents. And my other one was, it is a Messy Church book um, from, from BRF Messy Church, and it's called Messy Togetherness by Martin Payne. And it just explores the whole idea of being an intergenerational church. It is within the context of Messy Church, but all of the um, principles apply to all of our churches and all the services and so on that we that we put on and it's a it's a brilliant book just to get a background for intergenerational church and what that really means and how it can be a reality as well excellent thank you so much carriage thank you for yeah, sharing me. <laughs> it's great it's great it's great to hear um how the families how families are coming back and rebuilding and what we can do and um, that's a big encouragement we all know how important um families are in in churches that just, everything stems from family you know uh, so it's really really important to hear that and to be encouraged for us to be able to just move forth in this new season and it's, it's an exciting season what god is doing for us so thank you caris thank you 
We are going to hear from some of the experiences now of um, some of our CYF members, our children's uh, young people and family workers, and um, they're just going to share what it's been like this this, this last few months and, and ye years now. Gosh. Um, so yeah. So let's hear from some of some experiences. The last year has been really hard. Not seeing the children and families face to face with messy church, with all the other activities that take place in the building. But we've been able to do so many more things that have made us think outside the box. We've done messy church in a bag and we've been able to drop those to the doorstep. We've engaged with children and young people through Easter trails, Christmas trails. We've engaged with the businesses and it's become far more about community than it ever has been about just one group of people in the building. One of the challenging things has been not being able to meet physically, not being able to um, see past the um, just comments to what's really going on, not seeing the body language, just not being physically present. I guess the surprise of the last year has been um, just how creative uh, we can be and how uh, perhaps the change of media and the use of different platforms has um, grown some relationship and in fact I think uh, the surprising thing has been the depth of relationship that's built online with some of those um, children who perhaps struggled in the group before and uh, flourished in this time. Um, for me, lockdown has been very challenging because I would have normally done a lot of preparation and fundraising for holiday camps, things like Soul Survivor or DTI, and obviously they fell away. But the most surprising thing for me, I believe, has been the positivity of the young people. The last year has been difficult because we haven't been able to chat to parents and carers in the usual way at church. Not seeing, teaching and having fun with the children has been hard too. But one of the most wonderful things is that despite this, we've been able to keep connected with all our families in lots of different ways. And seeing families welcoming us, engaging with the faith activities we deliver and being thankful for them has been a joy. Um, one of the things that we found extremely difficult when we were thrown into lockdown in last March, the disconnection of the face to face. They're a generation that is steeped in technology, steeped in screens. And so I don't think it helped that that became them the only way that we could communicate and be together. Saying that, we're so grateful what we've seen here in our youth ministry is we had the ability and the opportunity to chop a lot of things away that we didn't need and we couldn't really do. And it opened up space for us to have deeper conversation, more in-depth conversation about the Bible, about being a Christian, a young Christian in the world today, about scripture. The last year has been really difficult uh, for me because I've really just missed seeing my young people face to face. Seeing them in a little box on Zoom just isn't the same. So I've really, personally, I've really missed seeing my young people face to face. Um, but one of the surprisingly good things to come out of it has been that it's forced us to be more creative in the way that we have to deliver um, our youth ministry. So yeah, creativity has been a really good positive from the pandemic for us. It's been a difficult season because of the lack of motivation from young people uh, due to lockdown. However, we have been surprised at the amount of young people we've been able to reach. We've reached young people overseas in cities we're not in because we are online. And so we are not limited by geographical uh, locations and restrictions, but we are able to support and help young people everywhere. As we've just heard, this this uh, last year or so has been really, really hard. And as we move forward and things kind of settle into whatever new normal is coming, we must go easy on ourselves and easy on those we work with, whether that be children, families or youth, or young people. As things open up, I think we need to forcefully resist the urge to jump back into our programmes and instead try and make space to pause and reflect, take time think about what has been lost, to, to lament what has been lost, but also, again, as we've heard in the video, to think about what might have been gained from this time. I heard a quote a few years ago, which I find quite helpful with this. 
it says, where the ideal is lacking, God's grace abounds. Where the ideal is lacking, God's grace abounds. And this year or so has been so, so many million miles away from ideal. But by his grace, God has been active, has been present for the whole time. For me, over this last year or so, much of what I've done in my youth work has been reduced to Zoom sessions, to parcel drop-offs on doorsteps, uh, and walks with young people one-to-one. And a highlight for me has been walking with young people. It's not something I've done before, not something I would have chosen, but it's actually been the highlight of this year. And there's a couple of young people in particular that I've heard more from this year than I ever have before in normal sessions. And it's because walking one-to-one, they can talk, and I can see what God's doing in a way that isn't always possible as part of a group session. Something about walking and talking side by side has really helped them to open up. The relationship with individuals this year um, has kind of replaced what we've been lacking uh, as a group. And I think as we come back together, as things open back up, we kind of build on that foundation relationship. One-to-one work is really important. And it's worth saying here that one-to-one work, as long as you have the right procedures and the right, kind of, um, the right policies in place, can happen and can happen well. The parents and carers, the young people I work with, uh, they know when and where I meet their young people and have their written consent to do it. Um, the one-to-one stuff, sometimes this year I found what has come out of a one-to-one session has been so much better than what I prepared to put on my Zoom session that week. Young people crave real, authentic relationships. They long to be known and accepted. And one-to-one work can offer the space and time for that to happen. As I mentioned above, it's been the unplanned stuff this year that I found has been much better than often what I've prepared. I, you know, I've sat for hours with young people on their doorsteps talking about knitting, Jesus, anything in between. And in the past, perhaps I've been so caught up in trying to dictate what we discussed, trying to find the, the perfect question to unlock the right answer. When really what I needed to do was just give space, space to hear uh, what young people are thinking, what's actually going on with them. And again, I'm not advocating abandoning planning, but the highlights this year have come from the young people, not from me. God is at work in them, in their lives. And I need to pull back. I need to uh, not try and curate what God is doing, but just be aware of it and join in. As I said, it's it's been a tough year. And for some of my young people, that's meant that I've barely been able to see them for all the time that we've had in lockdown, and etc. My small group, is smaller Um, and at times I've been quite self-critical and quite down um, on myself and and how they're engaging and I don't know if you felt the same I'm sure I'm not alone so just to be clear for my sake perhaps as well as yours but it's worth saying that small is okay bigger is not always better and it isn't our job to save young people anyway it's God's our job is to um, follow our calling and be faithful to our calling and trust God for the work and trust God in what he is doing to young people and get involved. A good example of this comes from a few years ago. Um, I wanted to start a group for unchurched young people who might have uh, a bit of desire to know more about God. The first night we, we opened, we had about 20 young people in and it was awful. They didn't want to kind of ha- ha- take time to have any questions. They didn't really have anything they wanted to learn. They just wanted something to do. And so that night we tied it up and we calmed down. We prayed and really felt that it was right for us um, just to focus on four young people that we'd seen where God was clearly doing something. The rest, we asked them, they, they came to our youth club. So my wife and I, we spent the whole year on these four young girls, um, just answering their questions, listening to what they wanted to know and spending time with them. And Growing, seeing them grow in their relationship with God and growing together as a group. It remains kind of one of the most significant moments I've had of being involved with young people. You know, for that um, context and that time, small worked because we got to know them. They got to know us and we got time to hear and see really what God was doing in their lives. We got time to ask the right questions. So just an encouragement, really, maybe for you, if there's smaller numbers post-COVID, I think that just gives you an opportunity to really go deeper with a small group that might not have been possible or feasible as part of a larger group. Maybe it might be that those who stay connected, God is really doing something and then there because God has started something that you need to get involved with and see through to the finish. We're lucky to get part of it, aren't we? And just to kind of finish off, I want to say again that 
we must take time before rushing back into what we used to do. It might be that there's an opportunity here for something better if we kind of give the time to look, to listen, and be prayerfully creative. And it's worth remembering that all, all, that, all that we do, and we can trust God with those we work with and trust God for what is next. Right. I think we're going to go to Army and potentially see if we have any questions. Thank you, Dan. That's, yeah, that is. I love the whole idea of walking and talking, you know, just that that one to one. Um, sometimes we can be in this day and age afraid to do one to one, but it's so important. Um, like I said, a young person just needs someone to listen to, you know, and away from all the other voices and, and just to be able to just to have that little bit of focus on them at times and, and one to one that enables that. Um, yeah, I have a question for you. Um, just it just was playing on my mind as you were as you were saying that this whole walking and talking. How do we walk, and how do we encourage our young people now into this new season, this new season where there is uncertainty, you know, um, everything's changed for them to a certain degree. How do we, how do we, yeah, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually walk them into this new season with confidence, with confidence in God and in themselves and in us, I guess, as well. Good question. I think the first thing I'd say is that perhaps remind the young people or help young people to see how much they've already adapted and developed and kind of they've, this is it, they've adapted to kind of homeschool learning, they've adapted to having to do the tests weekly if they're in, in secondary school and they they have come through this in a way that is really impressive and I think I might be pointing out to some young people that look you've done this you can do this God has been with you in this and I think part of that kind of reflecting on, on the time is moving forward it kind of it takes some honesty honesty from us as youth workers as as workers with them to kind of say I found this hard too but I have also found that in all I've been doing that God has been with me in it and I know he's going to see me through it and I think if we're able to have those honest conversations that that touch into real life they're not just disconnected um kind of chats i think that's something that kind of is it just goes back and forth with young people if we're being willing if we're honest and have a that authentic relationship with them then they feel they can do the same with us and we're able to kind of talk through uh, that process together um yeah i think that, that's what i would say yeah no thank you that's great thank you for that um we have a question from uh remco he's asking Unko is asking, uh, would asking the young people what they want to do together be a good idea when we start resuming activities? Yes, absolutely. I think start with where they are. Start, that we can't start with whether we want them to be or we'd like them to be. We have to start with, I think Karis mentioned this with family work as well. We have to start with where they are and go from there. And I think, as I said, we have to trust that God is at work. And so we have to trust that some of what that what young people are saying is because God is working in them and, and the questions they have might be better than the thing that I think they should be thinking about. So absolutely, I would say, yes, start with them and then see what comes. And then we perhaps guide and, and lead in that. But we have to trust that God is at work and kind of keep our eyes open to see what he's doing in the young people. Yeah, indeed. And then for those who have um, maybe lost some of their, their youth, their young people, um, and they've got reduced numbers now or starting from a very, you know, uh, smaller pool, what words of encouragement can you give them? Because, I mean, I know you touched on the fact that you were focusing on, on the four girls, and I love that, that, that focused work on, on, on the few, you know. Um, how do we... <sighs> How do we stay upbeat and stay challenged and not despise the small beginnings? So again, it's a good question. I just think, yeah, we have to start with the reality. We have to start with where we are. My, my, my group is probably smaller now than it was before. And there's some that I've said, like I said, been difficult to connect with. Um, but I'm going to focus with who I have and able to use that time. As I said, in a smaller group, it's easier to get to know them better. It's easier to... For, those are not quite as big a personality as a voice is to be heard. So I think we just start with who we're at and trust, again, trust God with that, that where we're at. And if we're faithful with who we have here, then that, that group of four girls ended up being 16 young people, mix of most of them on church, most of them have no connection with church. But because of that basis of four that, we, that I knew, we knew really well and they were comfortable with us, 
they invited their friends and when we actually brought in some from the church that we wanted that were a similar age it worked because there was that trust and so i would say build that trust build the relationships with the small group you have and just love them and share your heart for them and just see what god is saying to them and in that and i, I think stuff grows from that kind of those kind of foundations and again there's nothing wrong with having a big group nothing wrong with that that's not your reality that's fine but if you have a small group just start with them and see what happens um yeah in my kind of experience that kind of small and, and kind of strong foundation of relationship things can really grow and thrive in a in a real, real, real way so don't be down on that be excited about the time you get to spend with those young people uh, and see where it can go from there yeah great indeed exactly and then Vanessa's asking how do you help children that have lost someone close to them to COVID-19 you know like the loss of a grandparent or somebody who used to come to the church yeah that again that's that's a, that's a really difficult situation I think one of the biggest things we can do as, as youth workers as family workers children workers is just to be with them uh, I think again it, it's very easy to jump to simple answers and kind of like slightly cheesy phrases with people when it comes to loss. And again, there's nothing wrong with that because it's a difficult situation. But I think just being present uh, and listening, often I, I, I found that we don't need to say very much because it's, it's very difficult to find, again, find that right perfect phrase or thing. But be present and be honest and, and just say, you know, we, could, we believe and we know that God is with us by his Holy Spirit. And I think we can speak that into their life and into their kind of situation, their reality. But I, I don't think there's an easy answer. But I, I just think presence is really important. Be consistent, be present when you're not with them. Again, if it's young people and it's it, it's able to do so, be messaging them, keep in touch, so that you're there for them in any way that's that's helpful, um, and kind of see see if you can let them dictate that to some extent, and then, so they have the agency in that. Uh, but again, I, I haven't got some perfect, brilliant answer to say. But I would just kind of be prayerfully aware, be with them, be present. Um, and yeah just just be there i think i would say for that yeah that's great thank you dan some great advice there um okay wonderful are we gonna hit we're gonna look, look at some statistics um the stark reality of of life as it is at this moment in time but let's let's take a look and, and ponder on these stats we've heard this last year has been a challenge for us all and a really turbulent time for young people especially. Schools were open, schools were closed, schools open, schools closed. Young people have really lacked stability, routine and consistency throughout this pandemic with most connections outside of church um, and school drawing to a close. We've seen young people experience isolation, loneliness, mental health struggles as they adjust to a new normal. Parents, guardians and family members turned into homeschool teachers and school teachers when schools were open became a face of consistency in a really inconsistent time. All lines and boundaries became blurred for our young people. But now as we move forward, hopefully, we can see schools and churches playing key roles together in building relationships and connections. So I'm going to whisk through some things that might help you think about what it might look like for your church to engage with and make connections with your local schools. So firstly, I'd like you to think about your church building. 
what is your church building like? Is it accessible? Is it near a local school? So many after school based clubs, including sports clubs and music groups, stopped during the pandemic. And even now we see a gap of provision from outside the academic school curriculum. Could your church building be used to host after school clubs? In one of the local secondary schools I go into, through conversations with young people, I've really noticed an increase of young people wanting to apply for part time jobs find their independence financially and emotionally after being cooped up at home. What gifts in your congregation could help your local school? Do you have a job coach in your church congregation or someone who can help young people write CVs? Do you think you could set up a local job club to help those school leavers apply for jobs and prepare them for interviews? and provide a space for them to chat about how it's going in their new job. Notice the needs in your local school and see if your church can meet those needs practically, as well as emotionally and spiritually. I've also become aware of the impending finish date for our current year 11s, with most academic assessments taking place in May in place of the GCSE exams, which would normally be spread out over a long couple of months. We need to be aware that for many 16 year olds, their end date with school is within the next week or so. For a lot of our vulnerable young people, this means about four months with no engagement with adults outside of their homes. And that, of course, is if they have something to go on to in September. Either way, this is a really long summer ahead. So how will this affect your ministry in schools? Perhaps you might be able to provide a drop-in style space at your church for young people to have a safe place to hang out, connect and chat over the long summer, where good listening and relationship building is at the core of how you run that space. Maybe buy some donuts and buy some bean bags and set up this welcoming space in your church or in your church grounds. Could you have a conversation with your local secondary school and work in collaboration with them to create something that meets the needs of the young people. And again, it has been another unsettled school year for our upcoming year sevens. How does your ministry programme incorporate support for the transitional stage for our year sixes to year sevens this September? It's Your Move, the Scripture Union year six to year seven school transition programme could give you pointers on how to show God's love through supporting this crucial stage for our young people. Perhaps have a chat to your local school's pastoral care department and see how you can provide some friendly faces to help during the induction days and first weeks starting back in September. Alongside our young people, the pressures that teachers are facing in this time is extensive because they've not only been carrying the constant presence of being in the young people's lives, but the additional weight now of the psychological welfare of the young people too. And teachers just don't have the capacity to nurture the spiritual and emotional well-being of young people in addition to their amounting workload that they have to carry. And that's where we as children's families and youth workers have a role to play. And schools I have found have been welcoming with open arms to work with local churches. But this does come from a place of trust and friendship building with the staff. So how could you draw alongside teachers in your local schools and build relationships going forward? Could it be providing coffee and cakes one break time each week in the staff room? Or could an after school staff chaplaincy rota be put in place to bridge a connection between the teachers and the church? Youthscape did some research which found lamenting and expressing grief and suffering to be quite low down in what we practice as youth workers. And this needs to change. We need to engage with the difficult, raw emotions that we're seeing around us through creating spaces for young people to encounter God's presence. Prayer spaces in schools 
are a great charity for getting you thinking about what it might look like to bring quiet and reflective spaces to young people in school to help them engage with and process the emotions they might be feeling. In the emotional roller coaster training that was provided earlier in the year by our associations, they talked about tending to the emotional safety of young people by creating a safe environment and growing a relational connection. And prayer spaces are a great way to grow these connections in a safe way. So in conclusion, of course, we can connect with our schools in our classic approach of assemblies and RE lessons, but it could be so much more. So I hope and pray that this has given you some food for thought in imagining how your church could creatively connect with a local school over the coming weeks and months. Thanks. Wow. Well, well, that was, that was great. great. So many, I'm writing down all, all the ideas you just said. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> Love it. How to connect the schools and church and just, it's like creating a continuation, you know, in a way, isn't it? And it's about being really creative with that. And I love the ideas that you, you've you given us. Um, just even the whole making cakes for the class, the, the staff room, you know, because... I know that we, we do work in churches, um, in, in schools, but sometimes that initial, to get into a school is hard. Mm. Um, there's a, maybe a little bit of distrust or just, or unsure, you know, of who are these people, especially if they're talking God or anything like that, you know. And so, but to, sometimes you've got to just come with the, the love and the kindness and, and really just build those relationships, isn't it? That, yeah. To get, to get us in there. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, we've got some questions coming in, um, but my, my question is, so a church might be hearing this and they're thinking, this is great, this is great, but um, we had then have to create a team and what about all the um, issues around uh, safeguarding or just, just how comfortable am I interacting in, in that way in, in a sort of formal uh, setup as a school? What, what kind of reassurance can you give us around that? Yeah, um, well, I think definitely what you've just said about start, starting those small connections with schools. So if it is that you've got people who are perhaps a bit nervous about um, doing group work with young people or meeting with young people, have you got people in your congregation who are really excellent bakers and make great cakes? Because, yeah, that could be the way into the school. That could be... Um, yeah using the gifts that you've got in the congregation so I don't think it's about comparing oh gosh we're not doing that or you know have we got a team we could pull together to run a, um, a youth drop-in space but are there are there different ways you can use the gifts in your congregation um, so yeah it doesn't have to be the big the big grand things like Dan was saying you know go to the small and if it's with cakes baking and taking them to the teachers at school that's a really great way to start I think Okay, thank you. Um, Brian says, uh, we're also looking or thinking about what renew well-being for young people might look like. Um, I don't know if you can give us any insight on that, if you can tell us like how, is that something, is something a good idea to do with the schools and something we can integrate? Yeah, absolutely. And what the message behind Re Renew Wellbeing, where it's okay not to be okay, is just such a great statement for walking alongside young people as well. And I just think that's a brilliant way to start an initiative in a school. Um, if you're creating a space that is purely to walk alongside young people, listen to them, um, yeah, give them that space to know it's okay not to be okay, that's a great place to start. And I know Renew are looking at piloting some uh, projects with young people, you know, having young people in mind for a new. So, yeah, it's a great thing to be starting right now. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Mike says, our church has yet to reopen, but we have two asylum seeker children who are on the autistic spectrum. One is non-verbal. I mean, how do you, I guess, how do you connect with the, with the school and, and to, to, you know, to really support 
uh, children with um, some challenges or special needs? How do you how do you support combine that you know make that connection and then and then support in a way that's really going to be effective? Yeah, that's really tough. And again, you know, that's brilliant if you've got people who are who are um, have got lots of time and gifts with working with young people or children who've got learning difficulties. Um, but Again, I, I think the conversation, talking to the school, and if that's the approach you're wanting to take with building the relationship with the school first to get to know those young people or children, um, then, yeah, open, honest conversation with the school if they've got a pastoral care department or um, if they've got workers who are alongside those children, have a chat with them and talk about how you can best support the school in that. And is it... Is it providing a space after school for them to be with other children and young people or is it taking them out for a hot chocolate with a couple of their friends so yeah again conversation with the school is probably the best way to go yeah thank you that's excellent thank you savannah and um, we appreciate that um there are lots of uh people giving some um ideas in the chat as well Right. Um, urban saints do a great training and materials in regards to children with additional needs um so you can always go to urban saints and then there's there were lots of ideas earlier about um uh looking at forest church muddy church uh, yeah. all sorts of things you can you can look at uh in regards to your children and young people resources around that thank you savannah uh, that's that's great um i'm inspired about what we can start doing in our in schools rather than just offering the the just offering the obvious you know yeah, yeah. And, and i guess it's about thinking being really creative and and not going necessarily going for the obvious but going for the, what's needed yes yeah yeah because yeah. yeah. what might not be needed is another assembly at this moment in time yeah <laughs> yeah. Something else. yeah, so, yeah absolutely okay so yeah, so in this new season, we need to think, we need to think bigger and and bolder. Thank you for that. Sammy. We are um, going to hear now from Josiah. Josiah is a young person. Yeah, we have a young person here. Obviously, we should. Um, and he's just going to give some reflection, basically, on where he's at. Um, his reflection as a young person, young Christian, and how this time has been for him and uh, maybe his thoughts and plans moving forward in an uncertain but exciting time, hopefully. So, Josiah, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, so, in the past year, it's been really difficult for a lot of people, um, and a lot of people have suffered from the virus itself or the repercussions. Um, and the church has very much been affected by this as well. Um, we could just suddenly no longer meet um, in a church building uh, and this poses a bit of an issue um, for well a, a big issue for a lot of churches um, but the church leaders came together and um, although there was lots of um, different ideas behind what we could do instead we all came to a conclusion of sort of zoom churches or uh, facebook lives or uh, things like that to still uh, reach the congregation um, and although this was uh, this question was very quickly solved, uh, I think that um, for me, uh, I was posed with a lot of more um, uh, difficult questions to answer uh, in myself. Um, as a year eleven, I just spent three to five years um, uh, for, like doing practice exams and working towards my GCSEs, and then suddenly that was all over, and. I never did my GCSEs, and it felt a bit like I wasted um, like sort of five years. But I, so I kind of had a lot of free time on my hands all of a sudden, and I spent about three or four months just in my room and in my house, uh, thinking about sort of where where I was with my faith, but also um, what was next and where God was calling me to go. Um, and uh, I ended up uh, moving to London, which wasn't a planned thing, uh, and it was all quite last minute. But I became a student athlete in London, and uh, recently, so it's, um, where I am, there's a lot of guys from different places in uh, uh, Europe, uh, and we all sort of live with uh, different families. And recently, I was in the car with one of the families that my friend lives with, um, for like a their their far sort of homestay father, 
um, and we were sort of discussing uh, Christianity and my faith and his faith. Uh, and he asked me whether he could just ask me some challenging questions. And nobody had ever really said to me, just can I ask you some challenging questions? I'm not expecting good answers. And I'm not expecting answers at all. But I just want to pose these questions for you to sort of think about yourself and learn for yourself. Um, and so we sat for probably about three hours uh, and he just asked me questions um, about where I was and, uh, and certain verses in the Bible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I felt like actually this is what we've all needed. We've all been I have been posed with these questions through lockdown, but actually we sort of sometimes growing up in a in a church, uh, both of my parents are ministers, and I feel like sometimes I was just expected to know the answers to certain questions. And I was afraid to ask them because I thought, you know, I, I'm supposed to just know this and it'll be embarrassing if I, if I ask it. So I think leading into the future, I think that it'd be re it's really important to encourage young people to ask questions, ask young people questions, always expecting or um, being able to give the answer back to them sometimes. Uh, and sometimes it's good to ask a young person a question that even you don't know the answer to just to then start a discussion uh, and to also expect answers in return and encourage them to ask questions even if they feel like they should already know the answer. Um, and so, yeah, I just think, yeah, going into the future, we just need to um, ask more questions and also allow young people to uh, sort of give them that platform to ask more questions and be more, um, like, so I think we need to encourage people and tell people that it's okay to be um, confused or, it, like, uh, you're interested um, without knowing everything. So, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Josiah. That's that's a great insight. Seriously, um, it's so good to be able to hear that from you. Um, I think it's. I don't know if there's any young people on here listening. I think that's encouraging for for that for you, but it's also encouraging for us uh, working with young people. Um, just that whole, uh, that way to, uh, what came, popped out was the challenging times, challenging questions, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important to ask those questions of, of our young people and, and actually give space for our young people to ask questions, the challenging questions of us as well. Um, yeah, and I, I, yeah, go for it. I feel, I feel, um, actually lockdown has made uh, lots of our faiths either stronger um, or like I think the challenge of, of lockdown and the um, sort of challenge that's put on our faith has actually like definitely for me made my faith a lot stronger um, because I've been you know because I've been questioning other things um, I sort of relied on God to, to learn more um, and be less afraid to ask people questions because I feel like it's made us all vulnerable and I feel like it's um, made us more comfortable being vulnerable with each other as well. Yeah, yeah. There's that sh that that shared uncertainty, that shared you know we're all in this together kind of thing. Um, indeed, yeah, yeah. has made us more, um, and more vulnerable. But then it's opened us up to be able to have these discussions and these conversations and these questions, which is really really important. Um, this is how you've been feeling. Is this thinking about your friends um and, and and your peers how how do how have they coped how have they navigated through this you know yeah i think um a lot of my friends um uh, it's sort of you know people have had real struggles with their mental health especially um and i think that that sort of had an impact on their faith for a lot of them um they sort of come away from god and then um found god sort of found god again through through different means because I think, as, especially when COVID first hit, um, online church, we weren't used to it, and a lot of them sort of didn't come along to, to online church, we didn't come along to online youth groups or anything. Um, but I think more recently, they've definitely been coming back because um, I think the, the lack of hope at the beginning was really difficult. But I think coming back now, um, they've got, we've got much more um, hope, and uh, I think that it's been an opportunity for them to grow uh, on their own. And I think that church in a building has been very sort of, oh, well, I'm going to church every Sunday, so I'm a Christian. Uh, but I think having that, having to be at home, um, they've developed their faith 
uh, alone or with their friends. Uh, and I think actually come back with a much stronger face than they did before. Mm. See, that's the thing. It's, um, I guess uh, this is a time where our faith grows, isn't it? Our faith yeah. always grows in, in, in with challenges, with um, such a time as this, when there's, when there's struggles. And for a young person, it's, uh, it's important. I love the fact that you said there was, there was no hope in the beginning. Let's be real, you know, that, and this is the reality of it all. And, and we struggled, but there's anybody tell me that there's no resilience in young people. <laughs> it's there, you know, I mean, you're living proof of that and we see it every day in our young people. There's so much resilience just to push through. And, but sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need that encouragement from each other, um, from our, our, our youth workers or, or family members and that kind of friends and what's not. Um, but it's really good to be able to, to be able to look back now and see see the growth the growth that has taken place you know and and see yeah. how our faith faith has been challenged but faith has been maintained even if at times it didn't feel like it so that's that's really really great to know thank you Josiah thank you so much we love that absolutely love that um people are saying how they they miss you on on the chat <laughs> so <laughs> and they love you and, and we thank you so much so <laughs> just want to pass that on um we don't have much uh, longer left, but if you do have any questions that you would like to uh, pose to our wonderful uh, panel here, those of us in the room, please do put them in the chat. Um, and we just we want to be able to further this conversation and continue it on. Um, CYF is not something that we just talk about for five minutes and then we forget about it. This is the this is the crux of our church. Church does not happen without CYF. It just it the body of Christ does not exist without CYF. You know, we all have stemmed from families and children and been young people and, and we all grow. And so it's just so important to keep the dialogue open, to share, to support one another through this time. You know, we've got to build back better. We have to. Uh, we have to do it for our young people, for our children, for the families. So let's continue on the conversation continue on in your own church. I, I really encourage you to have these conversations amongst your youth ministry, amongst your team, your leadership team, your church and the general, you know, how can we build back? How can we really do something new? I feel like God has given us a, a big another chance to get these things right. So let's let's seize that opportunity, you know? And I just want to just let you know that there are um various other places that um you can go and, and 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 get information from um things like parenting for faith together at home that's already been mentioned kitchen table project um kids matter godly play at home you've got if you want to focus on that's around a family if you want to focus on church you know there's talking through informal education talking through play these are all different resources schools um, it's your move, TLG, Make Lunch, um, and all of their initiatives as well, their, um, their um, resources centres and, and um, uh, uh, lots of different uh, connections with churches that you can build upon, um, the prayer spaces in schools, uh, talking through some opportunities, talking through follow-up from emotional um, roller coaster. Yeah, the um, roller coaster training which TLG also do. So there's lots of different resources out there. We've mentioned Urban States, um, Youthscape, and I could go on, but please do contact us. Um, you know, lean on us, the, the CYF Roundtable. We are here to support you all in your ministries, and we just want to be able to um, let you know that there there is encouragement, there is prayer, there is growth, there is um, excitement excitement in us moving forward cyf in this next chapter i uh, just want to give a big thanks to baptist together and for for letting us be here and, and host this seminar and um obviously for keeping cyf at the center at the center of um church and how we see church grow in our organization and just thank you to everyone at the round table as well and um, all the members of it uh, for yeah doing all that we've done to come together on this and thank you to our panel Josiah thank you so much for sharing 
We really do appreciate that. Uh, Savannah, thank you. Karis, thank you. Dan, thank you. It was great to have you all um, come and share your insights to us. So, everybody, stay safe. Um, keep smiling. Uh, keep the resilience. Keep hope. Keep faith. Um, keep your children, your young people, your families, keep them encouraged, keep them happy, keep them wanting to come back to church. Um, continue to let, let God just use you completely and open our minds to creativity and the plans and the visions he has for our church, for our community in regards to CYF. We're going to build back better, people. There's no doubt about it. We're God's children. We can't do anything but. So let's do it together. Let's do it in unity and let's do it in love. Everybody, thank you so much. God bless you. God keep you. Let me just say a little blessing over you right now because I like to leave a blessing. May the families in your community and church know the spirit of God working in and through them. May the children in your community and church know how wonderfully made they are by their creator. May the young people in your community and church know the delight of being a friend of the one that saves. And may you be given all the wisdom, courage and compassion that is needed to lead at this time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Take care and we will see you soon. Thank you. Bye.